You're listening to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, your home for holistic, evidence-based cognitive enhancement strategies. And now your host, Eric Levi. Dr. Tracy Trancatella, thank you for joining me today on the Holistic Nootropics Podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I want to talk to you today, I mean, about a lot of different things. You're a naturopath up in, uh, up in Bend, Oregon. Right. So you're, a, you're a naturopath and, and you are very experienced in a lot of these more holistic medicines and holistic treatment. So I guess I kind of want to start with how, how did you get involved or what really drew you into the field of, of naturopathic medicine? Well, let's say I was, I was always interested in nutrition. And so that was my first love because I became aware at an early age, you know, how food made me feel and the quality of the food that I was eating and, and looking at the people around me and the choices that they were making. And so I started reading a lot of books and I was probably about 13 or so when I was doing this. I also had one of my aunts was very influential in guiding me through this whole process of becoming interested in natural medicine and natural health. And I had no awareness at that age of naturopathic medicine. I didn't even know that it existed. But um, I, my first love was nutrition. So when I went to college, I wanted to study nutrition. But at that time, that was probably like 30 some years ago, um, the jobs that were available for nutritionists, as they said in the college catalog, was you could work for a hospital or you could work for the airline industry. And I was like, well, that's not at all what I'm interested in. Why would I want to just be measuring grams of carbs and fats and proteins and putting together so-called visually balanced meals? That isn't what nutrition meant to me. And so I kind of backed out of that and I ended up going into like elementary education and um, and I met my husband and he was going to medical school and I was always just very interested in the medical sciences. You know, I'd love to just sit there and listen to uh, him and his fellow students just talk about medicine and what they were learning. And so I eventually went to a lecture that was given by a naturopath when we were up in Portland, Maine. And she had some brochures on the back table about naturopathic medicine. And it was like this aha moment because it was like, this is what I've been looking for. This has nutrition plus, you know, it's sort of like an alternative uh, medical school with an emphasis on nutrition and whole foods and staying healthy and preventing disease. And that's where my interest really was. So I went about looking into the naturopathic medical schools. And at that point, uh, there was a new college in Arizona, Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. It had only existed for about a year at that point. And so when it came time for my husband to do his internship, uh, he chose to intern down in Arizona so that I could go to school and start my naturopathic medical training. So it was a long process of, of trying to find what I was really interested in, but its core, I feel naturopathic medicine <coughs> offers so much, uh, so much more than just looking at things from a nutritional standpoint. Um, it's really, to me, is sort of like, at its heart, it is really functional medicine um, in, its, in its origination, how we look at the body. It's just that functional medicine now has taken the view of naturopathic medicine and kind of given it more of a scientific basis and structure. So the two meld together really well. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I've actually really gotten into the idea of, of naturopathic medicine in the last couple years. You know, I mean, I've always kind of been into this more alternative type medicine or this alternative type treatment because, I've, you know, I'm one of the people that the, the mainstream medical system failed, you know, right. and I, right. I think it just, it only takes so many times that you, you try to take the magic pill and you realize that the magic pill just isn't delivering the magic that you want. Mm -hmm. And then you start to say, well, there's got to be, there's got to be an answer. And, and I, and I think maybe now the process is different. You know, now you jump on a Google and you just start trying to figure stuff out yourself. And, and what I keep coming back to is it, it, it seems that maybe the naturopaths don't have the answer, but they have a place to start. And that's why mm -hmm. I really like it. Right. Well, and, and I would agree. I mean, we take a different approach. We understand where conventional medicine comes in and can be very useful. And I think there's more of a merging of 
the fields of medicine because we realize that you know every every aspect of medicine can have its shortcomings and if we can just have an open and honest conversation about which branch of medicine and is useful in certain circumstances where we really excel if we can come together and merge our efforts we can be that much better and you know when it comes to naturopathic medicine it takes a broad foundational view of your health to look at what's going on in each of your systems what are you eating how are you sleeping are you getting enough exercise uh, do you manage your stress well what's going on in your life that may be putting you at risk for certain diseases or disorders what is your family history or your potential genetics so there's so many things that we can take as a knowledge base and put that together and be very foundational in how we approach health for somebody and getting them well you know it isn't it isn't necessarily the diagnosis but how we approach getting people well because that's very foundational that foundational approach could be the same regardless of somebody's diagnosis they could have an autoimmune disorder they could have diabetes they could have heart disease we're going to start with a lot of the foundations to optimize their health and optimize function so they can function better at all levels regardless of the diagnosis and so you remove a lot of that extraneous stuff that may be contributing to ill health to begin with by taking a foundational approach and then what's left over is maybe what you have to have more targeted therapy and what you focus on but if you get the foundations in place and you optimize somebody's basic health you can get them to respond to other therapies a lot better and when you say foundations exactly what do you mean by that so foundations are the things that like go back to the, the basics of obviously nutrition. You're a nutritionist and you focus a lot on diet, nutrition, the quality of the food that you're consuming. You know, there are several different great diets out there, but none of them are going to work if you're consuming poor quality food within the structure of some diet, whether it's paleo, whether it's keto, whether it's it's gluten-free, casein-free, or a GAPS diet, or any of the number of diets out there, if the quality of the food that you're consuming is of poor quality, none of those diets are gonna be good for you. So diet and quality of food, I think, is important. Um, the amount of sleep that people get every night. You know, I've been reading this book, it's called The Circadian Code, and I mean, I've always been interested in circadian and uh, annual rhythms, biological rhythms, chronobiology, and the timing of events. We all have like this clock ticking away in our body. It's how we track time, how we mark the passage of time, which I think is really cool because it puts us back into this natural environment and a connection to the world. We, for the most part, feel so removed from our environment. We feel removed from the seasons. We feel removed from the transition of day to night. We, we feel removed from temperature. And so all of these things that are environmental can have an influence on, on our physiology. And there's, there's a way that those events are timed in a circadian rhythm that follows the pattern of light and dark. And there's a lot of other things that relate to that cycle as well, like the foods that we consume when we can best digest our food, uh, when we should be active, when we should be sleeping, when we should be in darkness, and when we go against those basic physiological, very primitive principles of who we are as, as beings on this earth, we, we get sick. So that's very foundational. Um, stress management, I think, is foundational. Um, gut function, digestive function, you know, which is related to the foods that we consume, controlling inflammation, to me, those are very foundational. Um, the Circadian Code. I'm going to put a link to that in our show notes. That sounds like a book. I, I definitely want to check that out. Um, right. It's so interesting you're talking about circadian rhythm because I, that has been at the front of my consciousness for the last year since I've been mm -hmm. living here in Puerto Rico. I mean, I moved from New York City to, uh, to Puerto Rico. It's like all mm -hmm. of a sudden, I can't keep my eyes open past nine o'clock at night. I'm waking up at six, no matter what. Um, and and then my body's just kind of working differently. My stress response is different. You know, I first became aware of that as 
as a component of looking at other biological rhythms. Not that I wasn't aware of it, but I had gone to this conference many years ago. Um, it was a hormonal conference, and it was about something called the Wiley Protocol. And she had written a couple books. One of them was um, called Sex, Lies, and Menopause, and the other one was called Lights Out, and it was about sleep. But she, she writes it, she was writing from the perspective of an anthropologist and looking at biological rhythms and earth rhythms. And, and to me, I was like, wow, you know, that's so fundamental to who we are as human beings. And we need to really look at that and work with our patients and clients at that level by asking them, you know, what time do you go to bed at night? You know, are you sleeping in a dark room? What are you doing when you get up in the morning? Are you, do you keep all of the blinds shut in your house? When do you get full spectrum light exposure? When do you get that exposure into your eyes? And to shut down that melatonin production and help, for, help cortisol to come up. We have to pay attention to those natural rhythms and try to live our lives accordingly so that we can set our own biological rhythm. So we're not off when it comes to that, because to me, that is really foundational. So, you know, getting people to pay attention to those things, to tracking their sleep, to tracking their screen time. Uh, we are so, especially now, since most people are working from home, we're in front of our computers a lot. So we're looking at screens, we're looking at our phones, we're looking at the TV, we're watching the news, we're, we're on our computers. And as you say, like, like gazing at long distances, you know, most of the time we're looking at something that is literally 18 inches from our face. And so our eyes become weakened as, as a result of that. So going outside and gazing into the, the distance, if we can do that. Uh, people who live in open spaces have that opportunity more so than people who live in more confined spaces like you living in New York. You know, you don't get to have that long expansive view unless it's probably down a, a long street. So, you know, there's so much to be said for just acknowledging and observing nature and trying to put yourself back in it. Yeah, I, I totally, I mean, a hundred percent agree. I've been uh, tracking my sleep with an aura ring for the last couple months. And, mm -hmm. you know, at first I didn't want to buy into the hype because I've heard about it so much. And then, you know, it's kind of simple and it's not a great activity tracker, but man, like when you really start to dive in past the data and look at your deep sleep and your REM sleep, and then you compare it to, you know, I compare it to what did I eat that day? What time did I go to bed? And you start seeing mm -hmm. patterns, you know, you start seeing like when I have alcohol, um, my deep and REM sleep is gone. If mm -hmm. I go to bed, now I have like a bedtime, <laughs> you know, it's like being 16 again, I have a bedtime again. Right. And, uh, right. and cause I'm like, if I don't go to bed at that time, then I know I'm not going to get the deep and REM sleep. And like I said, I can't sleep past a certain time anymore. Um, mm -hmm. so I think the ability to, to track, so technology, it's like a double-edged sword. It's like, yes, it's drawing us to our screens and driving us crazy. But at the same time, some really interesting technologies coming out that allow us to, to, I hate to use this word, but biohack, really kind of hack in mm -hmm. and, and kind right. of optimize, you know, your, your mind and body. Well, you can be your own personal study that mm -hmm. way. You, you don't necessarily have to rely on some outside source to, you know, go to a sleep clinic or something like that to gather that kind of data. You can do it from the comfort of your own home. And just because you're doing it doesn't mean you have to do it forever. What you're doing is you're, you're tracking experiences um, and sleep quality and all of those things to see what works for you so that you can plug that in. You're trying on different things to say, okay, what are my patterns? What are my cycles? I think as humans, we're going to be all very similar, but we all have our own individual preferences and, and little uh, um, things that we have to adhere to for ourselves to get a good night's sleep, for example. But, you know, just being aware of it and using that personal data is how we can improve our health, health at a very fundamental level, you know, and, you know, to take advantage of that, I think is, is great in this day and age. One thing I did want to ask you about here, you know, we're talking about the interplay of something like melatonin and cortisol and cortisol, I, I'm having more and more conversations and, and understanding cortisol more and more, you know, um, I think it's interesting because it's demonized, but it's also so necessary. But 
mm-hmm. in our day and age, it's so dysregulated in people. And, and I believe that comes from a foundational issue as well. Right. Um, right. So, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, so cortisol patterns follow the diurnal pattern. So they're highest in the morning and they taper as the day goes on. And they have an opposite pattern to melatonin output. You know, melatonin rises, starts to rise two to three hours before we go to bed. It usually peaks around 2 a.m. And then it starts to taper off when cortisol is supposed to come up and ready us for activity. So it starts, cortisol is a glucocorticoid hormone, which means it mobilizes sugar so that you have energy to tackle what's ahead of you. And it's also responsible for that fight or flight response that we feel when we feel stressed because this fight or flight response is a very primitive mechanism that readies us to either fight or flee. But our stressors today are a lot different than they were way back when. And so that, unfortunately, that primitive mechanism that mobilizes sugar so that we can uh, deal with a stressor isn't always required. So that sugar that we mobilize gets stored as fat instead of being utilized because usually the stress is something that is more psychological it is more of a psychological stress, work-related stress, emotional stress that is more internalized. And you can't always you know, do something physical to work that out because that's not where the stress is coming from. So it can, when you say that it could be demonized, it could be demonized if it's used incorrectly and if we have inappropriate stress responses. And so as part of like the sleep component, that's the thing that we can address and, and track and try to improve so that our body can rest and rejuvenate so that we have a better stress response. Um, you want to make sure that when you are igniting that stress response, it's appropriate to the stressor and that it's not going to require a big dump of sugar into your bloodstream because elevated cortisol also uh, is correlated with elevated insulin levels. And people can become insulin resistant if they're mobilizing sugar because of that stress response. And that's where that like increased belly fat comes in. You know, when you, as an extreme example, when you see somebody who is on steroid medication, if they're on prednisone or something because they have a chronic inflammatory condition, they have uh, a physical look about them that says they're overloaded on steroids. Their face gets really round, they get a dowager's hump, and they have a lot of belly fat. And their arms and their legs are skinny because they're kind of eating up the, the protein of their muscles and they're redirecting adipose to their belly. And so they have this look of having increased belly fat. And that can happen if you are mobilizing a lot of cortisol due to an inappropriate stress response. And that stress response is is going to be um, attenuated based on the quality of your sleep. Because if you're not sleeping well, your ability to appropriately respond to a stressor physiologically is going to be hampered. It could be overdone. And you just kind of recycle this problem. It becomes a circular problem where throughout the day, you're increasing your cortisol output and then you can't sleep at night because you're so jacked up on cortisol and those rhythms are completely off and unbalanced. And so, you know, I do a lot with people uh, with adrenal fatigue. I do salivary uh, adrenal testing where we're doing four times saliva measurements throughout the day to look at that diurnal pattern. But I always talk to them about sleep. What is the quality of your sleep? When do you go to bed? We talk about sleep hygiene uh, because you're not going to get that stress response and HPA access under control if somebody is not sleeping well. So, you know, cortisol is, is really important because it also, it's, it's produced by the adrenals. So the adrenals are part of your endocrine system. And as part of this system, Um, where you have the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the thyroid, the adrenals, and the gonadal tissue, they're connected as a system. So what is happening in one gland is going to have an influence over the other glands. So when you have a poor uh, stress response, it will affect sex hormones and it will affect thyroid hormones. So I like to do a complete evaluation of people by looking at adrenal hormones, thyroid hormones, and gonadal hormones, because that gives me a good picture 
of what is going on at a very basic metabolic level. Yeah, the concept of adrenal fatigue is so wild and it, it feels like something that can be so easily mismanaged, you know, and I think mm -hmm. so many people suffer from it who don't even know, you know, just like the classic wired and tired, you know, I talk mm -hmm. to so many people who it's like, I wake up in the morning and I'm tired and then I try to go to sleep at night and I can't fall asleep. And it's, and to me, the first thing I'm thinking is you just have, you have dysregulated HPA axis response, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're shooting out these, you know, uh, cortical release, cortical releasing, uh, is it CRT? Oh, no. Yeah. yeah, cortical well, releasing hormone. Got, yes. Yes. You got CRH and, CRH, and yep. ACTH is stimulated up in the pituitary and, you know, so all of this, it's a feedback. You know, yep. we know the endocrine system works on a, on a feedback loop, right? So the output feeds back to the gland that stimulated the production in the first place to say, um, you got a good response, so you tone down uh, the stimulation on the gland. So that's how it's supposed to work. And that's where it can become dysregulated or completely downregulated where it's, you're not able to respond to a stressor. Right. So if you have somebody then who has a diet high in sugar, let's say, mm -hmm. right, because, because the cortisol works along the, the whole biological purpose of cortisol is to mobilize sugar to get it to, to get it to yeah, fat or to, to get it to muscle. your body. Yeah. Right. To run from a tiger to, you know, to fight mm -hmm. or flight, you know? Um, so the, 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 the question I have is then, you know, does that also work for somebody who has a high sugar or high carbohydrate diet or the, like a carbohydrate diet in that their body breaks these things down, it turns into sugar in the body. And now it, you almost kind of create that feedback where the sugar mm -hmm. comes in. Now the insulin comes in, it delivers it. Now you have a, a quick drop in sugar, like a high glycemic situation. And then the yeah. cortisol is going to come in because, mm -hmm. because it's got to lift the sugar back up. And right. now you've just elicited a cortisol response and then you shoot right. that feedback loop off again. Is that mm -hmm. kind of on, yes. on the right yes. track? When you think about stressors, most people think about like mental, emotional stress. They don't think about physiological stressors. And so dysregulated blood sugar is a physiological stressor. And so again, getting back to the basics of a good diet, because that does have an effect on um, metabolism and maintaining stable blood sugar, because that's a priority your brain really only functions off of, of carbohydrates. It can utilize ketones from fat breakdown, but it's a priority to keep your brain going. So anything that supports that is going to happen and everything else is going to be secondary. So when somebody is eating a high carb processed food diet where they're jacking up their blood sugar, you're going to get this major flood of insulin to try to get that sugar out of the blood and either use it as energy or store it as fat. And because of that surge of insulin, you're going to get like a reactive hypoglycemia. As you were saying, you know, your blood sugar is going up and down because of the dietary choices. So when the blood sugar goes down in a response to reactive hypoglycemia, cortisol is going to go up again and you're going to stimulate that insulin response. You're going to break down your sugar stores. You're going to flood your, your blood with uh, insulin to try and get that, that sugar into the cells to be used. And this could be back and forth. And then people experience that hypoglycemia and what do they do? They go for more sugar or yeah. something more sweet. And that's kind of like your body telling you, I'm in trouble um, I need something quick and your brain makes the correct interpretation that you need some sugar. It's just that it shouldn't get to that point. That's the problem. It shouldn't be up and down like that. Yeah. You know, so. this, is, this is why the first place I start with people is I say, never eat sugar or carbs in the morning because that's when your cortisol is highest and then that's when it's going to get broken down to fat. And it's like, you know, I mean, my entire life up until a couple of years ago, it was like sugar in the morning, cereal, right? You know, especially you walk oh, around yeah. New York and it's like, I mean, there's these stands with bagels and donuts and, you know, croissants and everything. And, and it, it was getting into nutrition is when I realized like, oh my God, carbs are everywhere. We are literally yes. living in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You know, mm -hmm. you walk around and it's just like pastries and sugar and they're just like, eat it first thing in the morning. And then you right. wonder why it's like, 
people have all of these anxiety and ADHD issues and all these things because they just have a constant surge of panic from, from cortisol just being fired off all throughout the morning. It's the circular yeah. problem that I talked about. And it's sort of like, okay, so we know this is a problem leading to another problem, leading to another problem, leading back to the original problem. So where do we jump in on this? You know, so Doing salivary testing, I think, is great because it gives, you can probably, when you talk to somebody enough, you already know what it's going to look like by uh, taking a history from them. But it's great objective data to, to lay it out and to point out to them, this is what's happening. And based on your history, your dietary history, and everything that you're doing to yourself, this is what is resulting. And so it serves as a great learning tool. When people see it on paper, and numerically, they kind of get it. It reduces it down to some numbers. And you can basically tell them, okay, by looking at their pattern, you can tell them, um, you know, what their energy level is like during the day. And they look at you and they're like, oh, my God, you're right. I do get that afternoon drop off. I feel like I could really take a nap. And then, you know, sometime after dinner around 930 or 10, I get a second wind and then I can't go to sleep. And you're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we need to intervene at that level so that sleep is better. Energy is better. You're not desiring like what you're saying about carbohydrates. They're so easy to consume and they come in so many forms. And you know, they're so readily available. And then, you know, when you crash from that, don't worry, Starbucks is right around the corner. Mm -hmm. And then you get your coffee and then your sleep is further dysregulated. Even though you feel kind of tired, you're jacked up. And to your point, what you were saying about alcohol, I find this interesting because a lot of people drink alcohol to relax. And so they do feel relaxed initially because it increases GABA in the brain. And so you have that initial reaction. But Alcohol is processed like sugar. So it passes through the liver and it's processed very quickly. It messes with your blood sugar. And so it may get you to sleep. You sort of go to sleep in your little, you know, buzzed stupor, but probably an hour or two later, you're going to wake up and not have a very good, good night's sleep because of the alcohol, because of the way the sugar was processed. So, you know, and going back to like the other physiological stressors, um, when you're evaluating a patient, not only is the blood sugar an issue, but looking at gut function, digestion, food allergies, anything that could, could be promoting inflammation. Because inflammation triggers cortisol too. It's your body's own anti-inflammatory, really. And so you're going to um, trigger cortisol release if you're in a state of inflammation to try to suppress this reaction. Because Inflammation is at the core of just about every disease process, and our body does have mechanisms to try to keep that under control, but putting out a lot of cortisol to try to uh, control this random inflammatory process is not the best way to go about it. You have to look for the source of the inflammation, whether it's gut infections, it could be bacterial, parasitic, yeast, or you could just have gluten sensitivity or other food sensitivities that need to be teased out and, and cleared away so that the body can deal with the inflammation. The other thing is, as we had talked about sleep, you know, sleep, as we said, is such an important thing, but, you know, mental, emotional stressors, it's so hard to get people to acknowledge um, that the, the response they may be having is an overreaction because they're used to how they react to things and it's just normal for them. You know, so getting people to really take a moment to tune into their, their physiology, their body. How does their body feel right now? Uh, or do you have butterflies in your stomach? Are you breathing uh, in a shallow manner where you're not getting enough oxygen? You're not belly breathing so that you're calming yourself down. Um, are, are your muscles tight? Are you clenching your teeth? People don't really pay attention to what's going on in their body enough to know that they have a heightened stress response going on. So I think it's so important for us to communicate with our patients to say, okay, when something happens that's stressful to you, tune in to your body. What is happening? The digestive process is the complete opposite of, you know, being active and responding to stressors. So people, it's like they say, you should never eat when you're stressed, you know, because it's just going to sit in your belly. It's not going to digest well because you need to be in a relaxed state for all those digestive juices to come in and do their job and break down your food. And 
I mean, the, the implications of it are so broad, you know, when we really think about just the digestive process alone of being conscious when you're eating and not watching TV and looking at your phone and just shoveling food in your mouth and not chewing adequately. You know, it's, it's as foundational as it is to get outside and observe nature and, you know, light and dark cycles. It's being cognizant of what's happening to your body when you're eating your food. Are you chewing? Are you swallowing? Do you know when you're full? When your body's saying, you know, I've had enough, or are you just going to keep eating until your plate's empty and then feel stuffed at the end because you were so out of touch with what was going on with your body to begin with? So yeah, chewing, being relaxed, and also being with people. I mean, that's why dining is like, it's a group experience. I always look, you know, to the French for that. Everybody, you know, years ago, there was this French paradox, right? Where we compared how the French would eat to how Americans would eat. And the French would consume a lot of fat, a lot of saturated fat in sauces and creams and, you know, a lot of variety of foods. But because they're revered for their food and having really good food, they take a lot of pride in their food and the preparation and it being an art form. And people would get together and dine and be in a relaxed state and enjoying each other's company. So it was a process. It wasn't a rush thing. So consuming food was gathering, which is a stress reliever for a lot of people. Getting together with your family and your friends and enjoying yourself creates a, a state of relaxation. You, you de-stress in the presence of the people that you love and care about. So having a meal with people that you care about is, should be a relaxing thing. Now, you know, obviously, if you're, you're going to a family... <laughs> gathering and it's stressful for you. It's a whole different experience, but you just read my mind. <laughs> yes, I know. So, I mean, I can see you smiling there. So that, that's a different thing. So Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners and other holidays, we may have to put that out the window. You got to get the digestive different. enzymes. <laughs> yes. Bring your digestive enzymes when you have, you know, stressful family dinners, but, but you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah. I know what you mean. And it, and I've never heard the French paradox put that way. I've, I've read about the French paradox and to me, I've heard anything from, you know, well, they, their food just doesn't have as much gluten or, you know, their dairy is mm -hmm. cleaner to, I think somebody was like, well, the smoking keeps them thin, but <laughs> you know, what you're yeah. saying actually makes sense. It's like when you, when you, and, and I think there's a European thing in general, um, yes. which is when you eat, this is like a couple hours, right? Like yeah. you sit down and you know, you're going to get uh, an appetizer. You're going to get some wine and you're going to relax. You're going to talk to people. And then if you're trying to get in and out of like a European style restaurant in less than two hours, good luck. It is not mm -hmm. happening. Um, right. And so, you know, it, but they understand, I, I don't know if they understand anymore, but I know the traditional European cultures definitely understand this idea of you said, I mean, the Spanish take a three-hour uh, nap in the middle of the day, right? They so just, do the Italians. Yeah, they just shut everything down, right? Yes. Um, so, so eating is – and I don't know if the majority of people in this country don't eat when they're stressed. I think most people eat – the stress level is cranked up when there's food mm -hmm. going in, whether it's at yeah. work, in the car, even like with their significant other, there's a fight. Um, mm -hmm. I think people only know eating when they're stressed. Right. Well, and it's usually a rushed process here, you know, kind of like what you're saying. I'm, I mean, I think of European cultures, like I, I remember traveling to Italy many years ago. And as you were saying, all the stores and everything just shuts down for three hours in the afternoon because that's their big, biggest meal of the day. Um, they go home, they dine with their family, they have a little siesta and they de-stress and then they come back later and they do more work when it's cooler outside. Um, and they can finish up for the evening. But yeah, here meals are kind of uh, stressed. You know, they can be. I mean, we always make a point in our family, we have family dinner every night. We always have. Um, and I feel that's an important component to, to family where you sit down and reconnect with each other, uh, keeping in touch. But it's usually going to be our best meal of the day because we're really taking more time to prepare it. And so, yeah, it's important, you know, I think it's definitely important to have that relaxed setting. We've kind of lost that, you know, I think, it, and that has happened just because of our culture and the need to have, you know, two people working and 
you know, so, um, but we just have to find a way to simplify it so that we can still gather. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been prioritizing gut health in myself, in myself for a couple, you know, a couple of years now. It's, it's so important. And whenever I work with people, it's, it's really the foundation of where I kind of start everything. And, you know, I know myself when my gut is working right. And I know myself when my gut is not working right when something gets thrown off. And it's an amazing phenomenon that, you know, I, 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 and that's why, that's why I got into this because I personally experienced that feeling of mental clarity when the gut is working right, when you figure mm -hmm. out digestion, when you, when you sit down and you eat in a calm state and you're, and you know, you're, you're having regular bowel movements and, and you're not, you, you don't have crampy feelings, you're not bloated. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, what happens now is I know my gut is off. The biggest indicator for me is brain fog. And, and I think a lot of people are dealing with that and it's getting misdiagnosed as depression or it's getting misdiagnosed yeah. as fatigue. And this is where you start seeing the coffee mm -hmm. come in and the energy drinks or even the stimulants, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, gut health is everything. Oh, I, I would agree. You know, as a naturopath, we, we always start with the gut. And I remember saying back when I was in school, which I thought was funny and very appropriate. They said, if you can't talk about stool, you're in the wrong school. And I mean, it's very true. You know, you, you have to ask people about their gut function and their bowel movements and getting specific because what that looks like tells you something about their digestion. But I, I would agree wholeheartedly in that what is going on in your gut is going to affect your brain hugely. And it's, I mean, there's like a direct connection between your gut and your brain. We make a lot of our, our neurotransmitters in our gut. You know, 90% of the serotonin that we make is in our gut. So if you have poor gut function and the cells are inflamed and the, those functional units, which are the cells that line your gut, if they're, if they're inflamed, they're not going to be functioning properly. They're not going to function to make neurotransmitters. They're not going to function to make enzymes to, to absorb the nutrients from your food. Um, they're going to become dysfunctional in their ability to keep things out of general circulation that shouldn't be there. So there's a lot that goes on with the gut. So starting with the gut is huge. You know, there's, there's a lot of gut testing going on. So in, a, in addition to looking at salivary adrenal hormones and that, that is a basic functional program, looking at gut health and doing stool testing and looking at functional markers can make a big difference for people. Because I know that, as you were saying, like when, if my gut is not feeling good, I'm not feeling good up here either. I'm not feeling sharp mentally. I'm not feeling good emotionally. It's sort of, it, it, I mean, it, it's clear to me that there is a very strong connection there. And so working on the gut as a foundational aspect of creating health so that people can absorb the nutrients from their food, um, they don't get a lot of bloating or production of bad bacteria or yeast. You know, it's, it is key. It is essential. Yeah, and I, and I think what you said there too was the, the importance of being able to fully absorb your nutrients. You know, mm -hmm. um, we were talking a little bit before the podcast and I'm telling you, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of people who they, they have issues with supplements, you know, and they're like, oh, this, yeah. this 5-HTP or this tryptophan or this, you know, lion's mane or this whatever supplement, ah, it didn't work for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you start to dig deep into like, what's really going on with this person? And it's like, well, is your gut even absorbing the nutrients, you know? Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I could probably even, you could probably even tie that to the obesity epidemic, right? Where it's like mm -hmm. people eat and they eat, but they don't absorb the minerals and the vitamins and the nutrients from the food. And so the, even though they have the calories, it's almost like cardboard in the body. It's like the body hasn't filled the quota yeah. for vitamin C or B12 or, you know, zinc or whatever it is. And so the body's still craving these nutrients. And so you just keep eating and eating. And before you know it, you're bloated, you're tired, and you have not accomplished you know, really the goal of eating, which is to nourish the body. Right. No, I, I would agree with that. And that there's so much we have to do in looking at digestive function. And um, 
there's so many things that can go wrong when it's not working properly, you know, from just like feeling uncomfortable and having brain fog, as you had mentioned, to the more extreme aspect of that where you have some serious uh, mental health disorders as a result of having poor gut function. And then sadly, you know, a lot of people are put on medications to address these, these neurotransmitter imbalances supposedly that are usually only designed for short-term use that may or may not have some impact, um, but long-term use does not address the problem. And I, and I feel so badly for people who don't get that address, that gut issue addressed early on because they're on medications that they're just transitioning to higher dosages or they're transitioning to a different medication. And so there's a huge, there's huge room for like functional medicine and psychiatry and psychology to try to utilize some of the, this whole body approach to try and address mental health disorders and just optimizing brain function to begin with. Because again, if we don't start with the foundations, just taking a single supplement that makes all of these promises um, may or may not have any effect. It may have some effect, that effect may wear off over time because you haven't addressed the real problem, or it may have no effect at all because there's so many other problems that need to be addressed before this particular supplement, which promises to do this specific thing, could even function in your body because your body is so out of balance to begin with. Yeah, and then comes the whole issue of, okay, well, if you just start, you know, uh, going whole hog on like L-tyrosine or something, uh, you mm -hmm. know, or 5-HTP and your body is not processing that correctly. It's like, well, now you've, now you've just completely overdone it in the wrong direction, right? You know, because yes. serotonin syndrome is real, you know, you, uh, to excess tyrosine turns into excess dopamine, which, you know, that's the base of something like Parkinson's, you know, and you could have, uh, too much acetylcholine in your brain. You know, it, it, it's, it, I worry about people who just jump into the supplements too fast and don't do, I mean, that's the whole point of this channel is to talk about exactly what mm -hmm. you're saying, which is going at the foundations because look like when you, when you hit the foundation, right, when you get your gut working, if that's all you do and your gut is like popping Sarah, serotonin, it's popping dopamine, it's absorbing nutrients, you're, you're getting the, the selenium and the zinc and the magnesium from the food that you're eating and you're getting the mm -hmm. B vitamin. I mean, it's a game changer. And sure, maybe you pop on a, you know, a multivitamin on top of that or something. And, and just to, just to kind of put the cherry on top for a little right. extra juice. But I mean, until you really get to the root cause of your issue, I mean, you're never going to see that, that sustained optimization. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, a lot of people do neurotransmitter testing and um, base a lot of their therapy off of it. So they're kind of uh, tweaking and dialing in certain amino acids based on neurotransmitter testing, perhaps without doing the foundational work. And it, it has the same result that you were just talking about. You know, you don't know which direction you're pushing somebody. Um, and that neurotransmitter test may be conditional to what is going on um, in other areas of their body. So if we start trying to dial in neurotransmitters uh, through amino acid supplementation inappropriately, um, you could potentially make somebody worse. And as you say, there are people out there saying, well, you know, I, I have brain fog or I have depression or anxiety, so I'm going to dose up on these three amino acids. And so you're, you're flooding pathways, you're over flooding one pathway and leaving other pathways deficient. That's not balanced. And so again, too, in doing neurotransmitter testing, if you have imbalances going on, you shouldn't be addressing it with other neurotransmitters. You should be saying why. Why are there imbalances there? Um, and dial it back, you know, going back to the foundations of looking at gut function and absorption and potentially leaky gut, perhaps looking at um, nutrient testing where you can see if they've got some frank deficiencies. Whereas, you know, if you have deficiencies in certain minerals, that's the rate limiting step for a lot of reactions that need to occur at a biochemical level. If you just don't have the nutrients or you're low in zinc, which mediates a lot of biochemical pathways, things just aren't going to happen. And so that's where the, the functional foundational stuff comes in um, rather than, again, throwing supplements in because it sounds like a good idea.
Right. And then somebody hears you say, well, if you're low in zinc, this, and then they go, well, I'll just start taking a zinc supplement. And they go, oh, no. Because <laughs> now you've got these balances and minerals that you have to right. keep straight. Yes. And it's, it's, it's too much. I mean, it's too much for me to try to remember. Right. Um, right. But for you know, somebody who's not in this every day, it's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's difficult. But uh, we've kind of run up against time here, but um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate your time. I think we had a really fascinating conversation. I think we just barely scratched the surface. If there's someone who's listening, who's like, I want to work with Dr. Tracy, where can they find you? Can they contact you? Can they, can they look at your work anywhere online? Where would you direct somebody? Well, we have a website, mysunrisecenter.com. And Facebook pages, we have Sunrise Functional Medicine uh, through Facebook, Integrative Medicine Academy through Facebook. Integrative Medicine Academy is also a website uh, where my partner and I have put together some functional medicine uh, courses that can be taken online. Um, we also, for people out there who are interested in doing some lab testing, but they don't have access to a, a, a functional medicine or naturopathic practitioner where they are, they can go to labtestsplus.com where they can access a whole variety of different kinds of functional medicine testing. And in addition to having access to the tests, you also get a written interpretation from either Dr. Wohler or myself. So we have that available. Um, and just our practice website. So if somebody is interested in consulting, going to mysunrisecenter.com and either um, sending an email or calling directly, um, we can certainly give them some information. Before you sign off, do you have anything you want to leave people with? Any thoughts that have bubbled up over the last uh, 45 minutes or so? Um, any parting okay. words? I think going back to the idea of stress, you know, when we were talking about like self-awareness, I think that is key for a lot of people, especially now, you know, within the COVID crisis and lots of things going on in our world that, you know, is, is a, a big upheaval and a lot of change going on and, and people don't know the possible outcome uh, and they feel a lot of internal stress. And sometimes they really don't know why they're feeling stressed. And so I think an acknowledgement of that, but also finding ways to deal with certain stressors, getting outside, going for a walk, the things that we talked about before, um, not getting on your phone or your computer right away when you wake up in the morning is to give yourself a little bit of space uh, to ease into your day with a different mindset so that perhaps you can deal with stressors in a better way and tune in a bit, take a deep breath. It's all going to be okay. There you go. That's how all we'll right. leave it off. Okay. Dr. Trancatella, thank you so much for your time. This was an amazing podcast and I'm so excited for people to hear this. Thank you so much for joining me. All right. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And thank you viewer and listener for uh, listening and watching for more. Be sure to check out holisticnootropics.com for all the show notes to this podcast. Check out holisticnootropics.com forward slash podcast. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for listening. For more brain-boosting info, in-depth articles, and show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com.